The first gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 5 verses 33 to 37 and can be found on page 786 in your pew Bible. Again you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Let's now uh, prepare for our second scripture reading. It's the, from the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. So it's from the same uh, Gospel that Marilyn read. But here in a different section, we hear Jesus tell us a story. And he says, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later, he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Oh God, we thank you again so much for this chance to step out of the busyness of life and uh, to begin our week worshiping you, lifting you up, uh, for you are so good. You've given us life and the promise of eternal life, and we pray that as we continue to meet with you today, now in your word, that you would bless us and fill us with your grace. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one day, a daughter approached her mom in their living room, and she said, Mom, I know my birthday and Christmas aren't coming up anytime soon, but I had the strangest dream last night, and I think it could be some kind of a message. I dreamt we were standing in an empty field when suddenly a cell phone store appeared. Uh, we went inside and we picked out a brand new iPhone for me. Wow, her mother replied. What a coincidence. I had the same dream last night. Her daughter said, you did, eagerly. That's right, mom said. And in my dream, you paid for the phone. <laughs> well, you know, it's important for us, like the mother in our story, to be upfront about our intentions with others or about other things in, in general. As Jesus put it in our first gospel reading today, our yes should always be yes and our no should be no. And that sounds really good. But what happens when we're not sure how to respond? Uh, what if, for instance, we think we should say yes, but we really don't want to? Or vice versa. You know, we uh, don't want to say yes, but we really think that we should. You know, what happens when, you know, we get into that you know, fuzzy area. Well, that's the issue, I believe, that Jesus' parable in our second gospel reading and the context in which Jesus taught it, what they both speak to. They teach us why we should say yes in any given situation. It has to do with wanting 
to honor God rather than wanting to be honored by others. Wanting to honor God rather than to be honored by others. Now, this parable, which is commonly known today as the parable of the two sons, uh, it's found only in St. Matthew's Gospel. Uh, so thankfully, uh, St. Matthew uh, recorded it for us, so we have it today. And like all of Jesus' teachings, it's one that he would have given over and over again in different contexts. But here, Matthew relays one occasion, one important occasion, when Jesus gave it. And that context, the place and the situation in which Jesus gave this parable, it impacts its meaning. Uh, Matthew points out that this is one of the first parables that Jesus taught in Jerusalem. The day after he entered the city, that first Palm Sunday. Remember, that was the last week of his earthly life. And we know the, the events on that Palm Sunday. Remember that on that Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered the city, he immediately headed for the temple. And there, he made a ruckus. Remember, he confronted people who were ripping average Israelites off by selling them animals to sacrifice at inflated prices. You know, these folks in the, in the temple who we call money changers, they had a monopoly on the whole selling sacrificial animals gig, and they were taking advantage of it. Uh, so Jesus went in and he knocked over some of their advertisements and their displays, uh, saying in verse 13, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Well, you know, this, of course, you know, really ticked off some of the corrupt religious authorities in the city who were probably getting a cut from these money changers in their racket. And many of them, uh, they didn't like Jesus to begin with because after all, it was some of their henchmen who had been following Jesus around harassing him in the countryside throughout his ministry. Uh, but after this incident in the temple, you know, Undoubtedly, these corrupt leaders were grumbling, but Jesus left the city with his disciples. So maybe some of them thought, you know, thank God he's gone. Until the next day when Jesus showed up again <laughs> at the temple. Uh, and he probably upset these corrupt leaders even more, seeing him again, which is why we read in verse 23, which is just before our passage today, we read that they confront Jesus and they say, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Now they knew Jesus was a rabbi. They knew the role of traveling rabbis in their society. They knew how, you know, many of them were beloved by the people throughout the countryside. You know, they didn't have to, you know, do this. That was just rude. So they tried to bully Jesus into leaving. But Jesus, you know, who's determined to keep the conversation going with them and the crowd that, you know, had gathered that day in the temple, he responds by telling them that parable that we read a few minutes ago about these two sons. Uh, now, it's important to note that in Jesus' first century Jewish society, children were taught that they honored God when they did the good things their parents asked them to do. This is, you know, something that you can tell your kids or grandkids the next time they're acting out. And go and tell them that, you know, in Jesus' society, you know, uh, children honored God when they did the things that their parents uh, told them to do. So the first son in Jesus' story, by first saying no to his father's good request to help out in the fields, you know, that would have evoked a pretty strong response from other people in the household. You know, they would have heard no one been like, what did he just say? Because he risked that son being seen as dishonorable 
by others in the household who witnessed that exchange. You know, we can imagine them, you know, making comments to him about him as he walked by. It wouldn't have looked good for him at all. Um, Yet, that son then goes on to do what his father asked. So this son was obviously more concerned with honoring God than he was with being honored by others. The second son in Jesus' story, though, he first says yes to his father's request, which would have made him look really good in front of everybody in the household. You know, they would have been like, yeah, way to go. You're so much better than your punk brother, you know. All right, you said yes to what your father told you to do. They would all thought that he was a God-honoring son. But then, what does he do? He, he doesn't do what he said he would. You know, and we all know how frustrating, you know, that is when you ask your kids to do something, that clean their rooms or something, they say, yeah, I'll do it, while they're on their phone or whatever, and it never gets done. Well, that's essentially what happened. Uh, but in this context, where he says yes before the household, but doesn't follow through, well, that shows that he was more concerned with being honored by others than he was with honoring God uh, by actually doing what his father asked. Well, after Jesus tells this story in front of everybody in the temple, the, the, cent, the epicenter of the Jewish faith, after he tells the story, he puts the religious authorities on the spot by asking them which son in the story that they felt honored God. I mean, It was an obvious answer, and they answered correctly, responding in verse 31. Well, the first, the son who actually helped his father, rather than, you know, talking up a a big game and wanting to look good in front of others. So, the end of the lesson, right? Not quite, because Jesus, as he many times does, he pushes it further with these guys. In front of everybody in the temple again, He then compares these religious leaders, essentially, to the second son in the story, the one who wanted to be honored by others, but who didn't honor God by actually doing what he said. Um, We can guess, you know, how these leaders felt about that, you know. um, They were already upset with Jesus, and now here he goes, embarrassing them even further. But If that weren't controversial enough, Jesus then continues uh, comparing the tax collectors and prostitutes to the first son in the story. The son who the religious leaders themselves said honored God. Now, at first glance, this is where we might assume that now almost everybody in Jesus' audience got upset at this. Why? Because the actions of both tax collectors and prostitutes in general were despised by Israelites because of the pain that they caused others. Now, tax collectors were loathed because they were Israelites who were bagmen for the Romans, paid thugs who took needed resources by force from Israelite families. And this, of course, ended up hurting the most vulnerable in these families. You know, the sick, and the elderly, uh, children. Um, And prostitutes, male and female prostitutes, were disliked because their actions accomplished the same thing by undermining the moral order, which also weakened families. Also, ultimately, hurting the most vulnerable people in families the most. So, we'd think that in Jesus, you know, in the crowd gathered around Jesus and his audience, uh, many might have been thinking, you know, Jesus, we know that these corrupt religious leaders are no good, but, you know, my uncle Levi was beat up by a tax collector last week, so wouldn't it be more appropriate for you to say that, you know, well, all of these people are going to hell or something like that? Uh, Is Jesus here, in other words, saying that destroying people's lives in certain ways is better than destroying people's lives in, in others? Well, 
No, and that's because as we read on in the passage, we realize that Jesus is not only referring to tax collectors and prostitutes in general. He uses the definite article, the, to refer to the tax collectors and prostitutes. And who he's referring to are those who were no longer hurting people in those ways anymore. People like the first son in our story, who initially said no when asked to do what was honorable to God, but who then changed their mind and ended up doing the right thing after all. People like Matthew himself in the Gospels, who was a former thug, who was a former tax collector. A people who would never be honored by others, because of what they had formerly done, but who frankly didn't care because they chose now to honor God. And that was more important to them than impressing anybody else. See, the corrupt religious leaders, like the second stun in the story, they initially said yes when asked to do the right thing. They took vows to care for and support their fellow Israelites. Vows which would have certainly, you know, garnered the admiration of others. You know, they walked in the room and people were like, ooh, you know, religious people are here now. But then, like the second son, they went on to do just the opposite. You know, by cooperating with the Romans in ways that oppressed people. You know, remember the Roman leader over this region of Jerusalem had had gone crazy. He had, you know, a nervous breakdown, and so he was removed by the Romans, and there was no leadership. So they depended upon these religious leaders more than they did in their other provinces. And what did the religious leaders do when given that extra authority? They used it to mistreat the very people who they had vowed to care for and uh, to watch out for. Why? Because at the end of the day, they demonstrated through their actions that they cared more about what other people thought about them than they cared about honoring God. And so Jesus' message really is, is that regardless of who we are in any day and age, be it a corrupt leader, be it someone who destroys other people's lives in whatever way, or even be it a person of faith. The reasons why we all say yes in certain situations, they can be complex. There are many different reasons why. So Jesus here simplifies the decision for us. Whether we're a king or a peasant, a priest or a thief, whether the world loves us or despises us, regardless of who we were, are, or a moment ago intended to be, Jesus invites everyone, each of us, to ask ourselves, why am I, right now, at this moment, really saying yes to what I'm about to do? It doesn't matter why I said yes yesterday. Why am I doing it right now? Is it because I want to honor God, as Scripture defines that? Or am I saying yes for some other reason? Maybe because I want to be honored or be noticed or be admired by others. What am I really concerned with? Honoring God or being honored by others. Every moment is an opportunity for everyone to say yes for the right reason and in so doing choose to follow Christ. That choice in every situation is entirely ours. And may God bless us as we make it. Amen.